It's good to be here. What a beautiful day, too. Do you know it's supposed to be 65 degrees today? Yeah, I'll take it. And uh, what, a, what a beautiful sunny day. My wife and I are celebrating 34 years of marriage today. <laughs> 34 years ago today, she said, I do. And I said, I do too. <laughs> hmm. Man, my heart's about to bust. I'm, I am so blessed. Don't you feel that way? I mean, we have challenges and problems, but aren't we blessed? Yeah, we're blessed. Um, let me finish this message we started last week um, on church membership, the kingdom and church membership. Basically, we laid out some groundwork about how important it is to understand that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back for his church. We uncovered some things. We exposed the lies of Satan last week where we said, hey, we do fail each other. Pastors and elders fail people. You fail people. We fail people. We fail each other. But we have to forgive, work together, humble ourselves because he's coming back after his church. And I don't want to be on the wrong side of what Jesus died for. How many know he died for his church? He died for his people. And, and uh, I got a chance to say I'm sorry for anything that I have done to hurt anyone. Because I know I have. And I've gotten a chance to personally do that with some people. And, um, but we realize we're not to get our eyes on people. How many know getting our eyes on people will mess us up every time? We have to keep our eyes on the Lord. Somebody said, said, said um, love people, trust the Lord. You know, we trust the Lord. He never fails us. His love never fails us. And we have to love people. And uh, when we put our trust in each other too far, sometimes we, me we mess up, even when we don't want to. Quite honestly, there's been times, a lot of times, I never meant to hurt somebody, and I just did. I didn't even realize it. Have you ever done that? Now, let me tell you the real truth beyond that. that now, that's one level of truth. Here's another level. I've hurt a few people in my life because I wanted to. Isn't that sad? It's true. I felt like they give me some pain and I wanted them to feel it. You know why it's so quiet in here? Because you all mostly know what I'm talking about. Our flesh is flesh. It's sinful flesh. And that's why we have to put on the mind of Christ. We have to walk in this thing and realize that um, we're a part of the family of God and that, that we cannot ultimately serve God alone. We need him, we need each other to live this life that God's called us to live. So in your outline, I'm not going to do a, uh, I don't have time to do, you know, a rehearsal of last week. We're just going to dive in and go to the section that says, why serve as a member of a local church? Why serve as a member of local church? And I want to give you just three words accountability is number one because we have a sincere need for it since we're capable of going astray and we're capable of losing God's perspective. So there are some very highly intelligent, smart people in this room, but left to yourself, you can lose perspective. How many know we need sometimes, I, my wife, I need her perspective. I need to go to the word of God. I need to pray because left to myself, I can get in trouble. Amen? Amen? Are you saying that for you or for me? <laughs> Number two, fellowship. With people we learn to do life with as we care about each other. Fellowship is so important that we fellowship with God's people. And it's hard to have fellowship if you're not in the same ship. You know? Well, I belong to the universal church. How do you do that and go somewhere? you you, you got to be connected in one body, in one boat, going somewhere together. 
It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. And we are servants of the Lord. Third is responsibility. Why serve as a member of a local church? Responsibility, because being responsible for the godly success of Calvary, of this house, should be a high priority for each one of us who call this house of people your spiritual home. If, if this is or becoming or you're on your way towards either being a member, you are a member, or you're becoming a member, or you're, you know, that's a possibility, but you're new here, but, but you're entertaining that idea, um, it should be a high priority for you to make sure that is from your standpoint, from your love, from your servitude, from your heart, that this church is a success. That's what you want. It's the commitment to be identified and avidly connected with a local body of believers who are growing together as disciples of Jesus. Man, there are some of you that I, when I'm in a struggle, when I'm in a spiritual battle, I know I can call you. I can know I can give you a text and say, pray for us this week, pray for me. And I can sense you pulling with us. There's been a few people in my life that I probably wouldn't tell them because instead of pulling with me, they'd, they'd want to know all the dirt. Is there any of you that like to know all the dirt? Don't raise your hand, please. And uh, we have to be careful with it, with the attitude of that. So the next section is what is the necessity of local church membership? Why, why is that necessary? One is worship. Worship in a setting of community as we invite the presence of the king. You know, the presence of the Lord here is rich because when we come together and worship the Lord and entertain his presence, he shows up. There's nothing like the presence of God in our lives. Man. Second is that word fellowship again with brothers and sisters who share in the same mission and purpose. We're on a mission. God's given us as a church a purpose. Third is education in the sense of iron sharpening iron as we learn God's word together and never become an island to ourselves. The enemy, I've watched this over and over and over as a pastor. One of the first things that the enemy does when he tries to steal a brother or sister or tries to move in and, and destroy relationship is he tries to get people to become, to pull back, to withdraw, to jump in a hole, to become an island to themselves. I'm not coming till this gets works out. I'm going to be alone. I, I, or I'm just going to stay home and pray. And what happens is, you know, it's kind of like the, the guy who they found him after 20 years on a deserted island alone for 20 years. And they found him. He was so happy that he was found. And they saw up on the cliff of the island this beautiful home, and they said, well, whose house is that? And said, well, I've been here 20 years. I built me a beautiful home. And then they saw that other building next to it and said, what's that? He said, well, I built me a church. That's my church. Wow, you did that? Yeah. And there was three buildings. And they said, well, well there's another building up there. What's that beautiful building? And he said, well, that's, that's the church I used to go to. Terrible. Fourth is outreach. As we take the message of the gospel to our community and the world, without attention to these things regularly, any one of us could divert God's plan for us. In times past, we've had struggles going on here at Calvary. Can you imagine? We've had struggles here at Calvary. Hard to imagine, isn't it? You thought we were perfect, right? Amen? <laughs> And enough people became occupied in some of the struggles that we've endured around here that the ministry of our church was hindered until we got through it. Each one of us has a part in making the body of Christ function here at Calvary. And the job of leaders is not to do all the ministry while the others only watch or receive it. In fact, let me tell you something else. It's not the job of leaders to even make all the decisions. We're to serve and guide and Love and pray for the flock, but we've got talented people here that can make wonderful decisions. Think about Kathy and I. 
Oh, Kathy, we've been married 34 years today. And when, when we came to the Quad Cities, I was 34. And God put incredibly talented people in this house that allowed us to do things that I knew nothing about. Did God call me to be a pastor and to lead? Yeah. Did I have all the gifts to do it? Nope. I'm one guy. But God put a network of his people together. You you think about this building you're sitting in right now. Just think about it. I came to town. I never built a doghouse before. Serious. This is a pretty incredible place, if you think about it. And um, the outreaches that um, God's helped us to be a part of, the churches that are being built around the world, I was hoping today we'd get to show you some pictures. Maybe next week we, we got pictures of a church in Africa that's completely done in the well and all of that from when we sent Bob and Pat Harris and one of our elders that moved away and we had a day of rejoicing with them. And we, I got an email this week just thanking God. And we even helped a pastor that's a pastor of this church bought him some land that allows him and his family to grow vegetables to self-sustain themselves while they're pastoring the church. We may never meet those people. I may may never be inside those four walls halfway around the world. And here we are helping to plant churches in Africa and India. And we may never see them on this side of heaven. But God. Talk about the way God puts, networks us together. And God's put people in here. Pastor Glenn would probably love to tell you about it. I don't believe he's here. Um, I got word that him and Dana are be praying for them. A beloved dog of theirs they've had for many, many years. They may have to put their dog down today. It's a tough time. Been through that, haven't we, honey? So, outreach. It's unhealthy for a person to benefit from the ministry of the church and not eventually contribute what they have to offer. The engagement of so many of you is so wonderful. I look across this audience and the engagement of your love and your care and your desire for Calvary to do well speaks so highly of you. But there are some people in the church and maybe maybe somebody here, and if if you're this person that I'm about to explain, just keep smiling, I won't know it's you, who attend, but by your lack of engagement, you're saying... This, preach to me, sing to me, serve me. If I'm sick, visit me. If I need encouragement, encourage me. But don't expect me to give of any of my time or my talents or my resources to the church. Unless there's a good reason, people like this, I don't want to be mean, suck the lifeblood of a local church and insult God the Father who's invited us to be a part of his family. Let me read to you Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. That's why he saved us. And God did not call 20% of the church here at Calvary to serve 80%. He's called 100% of Calvary church people to serve 100% of him and each other. This is why people are asked to commit to serve, to use their abilities. God gave them at Calvary a minimum of once per month and be on a schedule so there's built-in accountability We're asking you to be on a schedule. Well, I'll do something once in a while if I feel like it, but I'm not going to be on no schedule. Oh, really? Well, Pastor, I'm a busy man, and I'll serve if I have time. Oh, really? So your service to God and your service to the family of God and to each other is based on if you have enough time to carve a little of that into your busy schedule. 
Oh, really? We're a family church. Four generations of people that serve God together here. We have families that are four generations sitting together in this church this morning. We've got older people that have gotten older and would love to serve and physically can't, and they get a pass. We've got babies right now that people are taking their time and would love to be in here and are in that nursery cuddling babies and rocking them and changing diapers so some moms and dads can be in here together. We serve each other. We take care of each other. We do what it takes. So I want to tell you, I owe it to tell you this. You say, well, Pastor, what kind of a growth strategy is this? Not a good one. (laughs) If you're here to take and never give and never serve and never enter into a relationship with a few people and connect, Please don't stay here. You might mess up everything that we're about. Do I want you here? Yes. Do I want that culture to shift? Because that was me a few years ago. Hey, dumb this thing down. Let people do whatever they want to do. Let everything go because all, it's all about counting how many, excuse me, how many butts are in seats. That's not pastoring. That's not being an elder. That's being careless. It's being a coward. It's not being honest. It's not preaching the word of God and God's plan for his church. We're to sacrifice for each other. Serve if we have time. What kind of sacrifice is that? Serve if we feel like it. See, I've said those things because that's the world we live in. And do do you realize this? If we have that attitude, the devil will make sure we never have time for God. We'll never have time to pray, never have time to get in his word, never have time to live the life that he's called us to live. Busy doing things that are maybe not bad, but have very little to do with eternity. So... If you struggle with decisions that are made around here, talk to us. We might need to hear from you. You might have some valid things to share. I don't believe I've ever turned anybody away who wanted to come and talk and challenge me or the other pastors or the other elders and communicate with us instead of going sideways. We realize we are not, we are flawed men. Does everyone do this? No. You know, let me tell you something. I have a paper here with me, the names of all of our members and regular attendees who are not on a schedule to serve in a department in our church at least once per month. And I want to read their names to you this morning. No, I won't do it. So before I move on, let me ask you something. I want want us to think about this together. When does, when should a leader, an elder, a pastor, a mature man or woman of God, when does a leader ask hard questions because they're watching out and caring for people's souls. When do we? 
And when is the leader being too in your face, so to speak, and needs to let people figure it out? I mean, you think about that. If, if, a, if some of our pastors and elders are actually trying to get it right, trying to have enough prayerful, loving, serving hearts to serve the people and ask, I mean, ladies, think about this. How much would you like another man in your husband's life to ask a hard question? Be real quiet. Don't act like you're. Some of you ladies are doing this. <laughs> but I can't see it, but you're doing it inside. How many of you husbands out there would like your wife to have godly relationships with other ladies in the house to where you can work on each other and become the godly woman, the godly mother, the godly wife. Men can become the godly husband. And here's what, here is what Satan has allowed to happen in the church or people have allowed Satan to do in the household of God for us to dumb this thing down and not have any kind of relationships or conversations that have any meaning whatsoever. We think going out and having a piece of pizza and a Coke is Wonderful fellowship. And I, Pastor, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to cause more work for yourself? Well, I guess so. I've spent a big chunk of my life spending a ton of time in ministry, so to speak, doing everything but what God's called me to do as a pastor. See, pastors have that same problem. We have that same challenge. We like to dumb this thing down too so we can go play golf. Sometimes I need a golfing buddy. Sometimes I need somebody else that's more than that or different than that. Thank God I got some men who will pray with me. There's a few men in this church that will pray with me and pray the paint off the wall. So what's too much? What's not enough? Here's what I'm saying. Here's what I want you to take home on that point. If we're trying to get it right, we'll miss it sometimes. And if you can be offended... If you're like me, I've chose to be offended sometimes. Here's a good way to live. I refuse to be offended. If I've got somebody in my life who's asking me a hard question, even if I don't like it, you know what I need to do? Thank them. Thank somebody that I have, I have a friend that is willing to risk it for the biscuit. Right? Even if I don't agree with them, thank you for caring enough. All right, let me go on the next section. Why are spiritual gifts needed in the church body? Spiritual gifts come from divine empowering by the Holy Spirit that allow God's people to glorify him and build up his body. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11, he wrote, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all your strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. A spiritual gift is an ability given by God to be used through a believer for the purpose of building up God's kingdom and maturing his body. The Bible is clear. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. 
And even if we do not know what our spiritual gift is, God knows, and he'll reveal it to us. It seems, though, he only hits a moving target. I've, I've been this guy. Well, I'm going to sit down and relax and take it easy, and God, let me know when you got something for me to do. Hope somebody calls me, lets me know, because I'm off the hook until somebody asks or so, until somebody gets in my face or somebody asks me. If they don't ask me, I can't help it. God, you know, I'm willing. Doom, doom, doom. Hmm. Seems like God only hits a moving target. What do I mean? We can't sit around doing nothing until God reveals it to us. What do we do? Bible says we're to wait on the Lord. That word waiting doesn't mean sit on your seat and do nothing. It means while we're waiting on God to fulfill all that he's going to do in us and through us, we're busy serving, waiting tables, waiting on the Lord, serving one another, serving God's people, serving the Lord. While we're waiting for him to fulfill all that he wants to do through us, there are certain things we can do. We don't have to say, God, is it your will? Should I smile at that person today who looks lonely? Should I give them a warm handshake? Well, I guess if God don't tell me. You know, it looks like the floor needs vacuumed at Calvary. I sure hope somebody does their job. Boy, I'm off my notes terrible. I'm going to skip the whole next section but I'll just say a couple of things about it. It's in your notes. Why should members of a local church give financially? And I don't have time. I'm running out of time, and I want to finish this. So I'll just say a couple of things about giving financially as members. Here's, here's, here's what I know is true in the Word of God. Giving financially to God's house is a privilege, and it's a responsibility. It's a great privilege and it's a responsibility. Kathy and I, 34 years ago uh, today, decided when we get a paycheck, we learned that, in the Bible, we learned that tithing is not 10%, it's the first 10%. And then in the New Testament, 10% is a starting point, not an ending point. It's a beginning, not an end. And I've heard churches, peers of mine, say, now if you can't give 10%, give 2%. That's dumbing down the truth of God's word. That's not right. Well, God understands. Hey, we teach principles here. You've got to make your own decisions. We're not after your money. God's not broke. If ever Calvary doesn't make it financially, there's not an ownership problem of God not having enough money. There might be a giving problem, but there's not an ownership problem. And we're not beggars. I hardly ever talk about money because to my own fault, I don't want to be blamed as one of those money preachers. In fact, I would say there's a scripture, and I think I put it in your notes, that we're to give cheerfully and give, uh, uh, and we're to think about what we're going to give and do it not because of compulsion of somebody like, a, like Tim Bowman, but give out of the joy and out of the desire of your heart to give. And if you don't have a joy to give, now you won't hear very many preachers say this, keep it. Keep it. Well, pastor, if I don't give to Calvary, I don't know if you're going to get your bills paid. Well, we don't, we don't. This is God's house. And he'll raise up people that have a heart to give. And if you don't have the heart to give right now, don't. And when you do give, give because you have this great joy. See, I would rather give to God than give to Mid-American any day. <laughs> any day. 
if I'm going to owe God or owe Mid-American, I'd rather owe Mid-American. That's just me. Everything I give, Kathy, everything we give to the work of the Lord may leave our hand, but it never leaves our life. It goes into eternity. When I pay the electric bill, enjoy the electricity. It's gone. So, that's enough on that one. There's so much to be said. You all know I could do a lot more on that. Um, Let me skip to the last section. And I'm sorry, if you get in the app, you can get all the words for your outline. I want to end with tips on how to recognize the right church for you. In case you're new here or in case you've been here a long time, how do we know if we have the right church? And I just wrote some things down. I thought, Lord, man, this was a great exercise for me. Here's what we wrote, and I'll just read it to you. It's right out of your outline. Number one, a healthy church clearly proclaims and teaches the Old and New Testaments of the Bible as the whole counsel of God. There's so much to be said about that. But folks, the Old and New Testament is God's word to us. You're not going to understand the new if you don't understand some of the old. Because every page in this Bible is about Jesus. Every page is about Jesus. Number two, a healthy church works towards an accountability system where people are lovingly held responsible for their lifestyle and humbly disciplined when they rebel against God's standards. That's how you know if it's a healthy church. Pastor, are you saying that I, when I come to Calvary and I'm a part of Calvary, that if I get ready to mess up or do something that doesn't please God, that I should literally feel like there is a sense of accountability in my church that somebody might ask me something? Boy, that's what I need in my life. I need accountability. I need to know that there are pastors and elders that are not going to let me get by with something that is not pleasing to God. If they see it, they're going to question it. Third, a healthy church desires to impact each area of God's decentralized form of government, which are personal, family, church, and civil. We spent a lot of time on that in the past. I'll go on to number four. A healthy church provides opportunities to use people's gifts and skills to serve others. And five, a healthy church has a passion to share the gospel message and see people coming to Christ and develop their faith. And six, a healthy church supports the weak, helps the needy, and encourages the downhearted. There's really nothing like a good Bible-centered church, a place where eternal friends can be made with Jesus and each other, a place where the ongoing support during times of grief, tragedy, joy, or celebration are happening. So I would say keep these things in mind if you're seeking a church family. And if you're here and you're a part of the Calvary family, Help to ensure that these things are a huge part of who we are every week. Only the church possesses the keys to God's kingdom to access heaven's authority in the earth. And our involvement in the local church is critical to our spiritual health. That's the the section, and I skipped over a lot today, but I think we got enough of what church membership kingdom church membership is about next week we're going to dive into something brand new that i'm so excited about but enough for today stand to your feet we're going to close i want to pray lord i pray that hearts and minds are open to the understanding lord that it's a great joy and privilege and responsibility to be a part of a local household of faith and to be committed and submitted to each other and to you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we will grow in these things and that you will have your way in our hearts and we will not fall prey to the culture of the world that we live in. 
where we are independent of each other and that success, the world says success means that you can do what you want, say what you want, go where you want. That is not success for a, for a child of God. We belong to you. Your spirit orders and directs our steps. And Lord, we thank you for that privilege. Amen and amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. You need prayer?